Welcome, my name is John Reynolds. In this episode, I'm talking to Bob Wigley, Helen Chorley and Steve Bolton about their experiences in investment, angel and both venture capital. Without further ado, let's meet the panel. Steve, Helen, Bob, welcome. Thanks for having us. Let's start with a little bit about yourselves. Steve, do you want to go first? Uh, entrepreneur, 25 years, uh, angel and venture investor for the last 15 years and currently run an angel and venture syndicate. Um, I'm a property investor. I'm an ex-investment banker, went into property after that, and then more recently an angel investor as well, and I run a women's community in property as well. Awesome. Thank you. Bob? I uh, was a banker for 25 years, ended up being the European chairman of Merrill Lynch, uh, left 10 years ago. Uh, I'm now an angel investor. Uh, I'm a partner in a space tech fund, uh, which is a sort of a VC fund, and a partner in a uh, private equity fund. Thanks, guys. So first question, how do you categorize various stages of investment? Steve, do you want to go first? Sure. I think uh, most entrepreneurs tend to start with their own money and then move on to friends and family. And if they continue on the journey, angels, high net worth investors, then venture, sort of 2 million plus, then private equity beyond that, 20 million, 50 million plus, and then IPOs, stock market, um, that type of thing, trade sales to global majors. So that, is how I kind of view the funding journey. I think you might have covered them all there, unless you yeah, guys have done any more. Yeah, yeah, done it all for you. Um, so, Helen, start with you. How, how would you, how did you actually start out angel investing? So, from an investment banking point of view. Yeah. What led to you becoming an angel investor? So I went into property straight after banking because I'd always had a passion for that, um, and I thought I could be a passive investor, hand my money over, go off, live in the sun didn't quite work out like that. And actually from there, it's kind of been organic. Then I've been invited to become an NED or board advisor. And when I've been working with companies and I've seen how they progressed, it's been a very natural step to, you know, guiding them. Then I believe in what they're doing, buy into that and then into angel investing with businesses. Thank you. What about yourself? Mine was almost by accident. I was at Oxford University at an event for students where on the MBA course there, uh, they have to pitch a business idea at the end of the year. And there were two sort of luminary investors, one of whom was Philip Green, and the other was a guy who'd founded one of the big, one of, I think it was uh, Kravis. And uh, someone pitched an idea, which was a door handle that when, you, uh, that when you turn it, it excretes sanitizer onto your hand. So as you walk through the door, you're forced to wash your hands. Yep. Uh, the unfortunate thing was that the, <laughs> the prototype actually looked like a penis. So basically, <laughs> the, the judges decided that they didn't like this prototype, and Philip Green in particular. But I thought the idea was good. So after the competition was over, I went round to the guys and I said, right, we need to obviously change the shape of the handle, yeah. but, but the idea is a good one. And of course, COVID has been the, you know, the success of that business. Comes down to timing there as well. So we're a bit ahead of our time, but you know, it's, yes. it's, it's a business in America called Altitude Medical now. Awesome. Steve? Yeah, I think in my mid twenties, I had an entrepreneurial seizure. So I sort of got fed up working for a boss um, and started my first business. So learned a lot and that was kind of investing my own money, got loans from banks, got some of those businesses had private equity uh, investment into them. So went through that whole journey and then really started doing sort of sideline angel investing where people would come to me with an idea and uh, I did a horrific job. I lost money, I think, on my first five investments because I didn't know what I was doing and as Helen was talking about, you sort of place bets. Um, and then when I exited a business, that gave me more kind of choice and options. And then I basically took angel and venture investing very seriously. So when an entrepreneur comes looking for investment and capital, how important to that entrepreneur is the capital against the experience they're going to get from having investment from people like yourself? I think both are crucial. So yeah, so I, um, I never invest just to give someone money. Uh, I have my own criteria about why I choose people, but, but one, of, one of the most important is recognizing that that person has uh, not only the cap capability to implement the business plan they brought you, but understands what they don't know. Because one of the things you discover about entrepreneurs and one of the reasons we love them is they suffer from what I call clinical optimal delusion. They have this incredible self-belief and, and the belief that their product is the best thing since sliced bread, literally. And some of them can't listen to the, the advice and the, the mentorship around how to make it even better or some of the problems that may come along. So it's finding someone who's got that, that combination of that grit, determination, bulldozing capability of the early stage of a business, but also is prepared to take advice, take on board you know, expertise from people who've done it before. Um, so yeah, both are really important. 
Totally. What about yourself? Ian? Very much echo that. You need somebody with the vision, but also with the humility to listen. Listening is is absolutely key. And, and likewise, I just don't do passive. Um, I, I want to get involved. You know, I want to. It's I'm the custodian of my own money at the end of the day. So I'm going to make sure that that person, that business, and my money is given the best opportunity to succeed. And what I bring to the table is the best way of ensuring that. Quick, before you answer, Steve, how important then is the individual against the business? Because would you ever have a situation where you think the individual is incredible, but the business is weak or vice versa? Would that stop you investing? It, yes, and it has done every time when there's been people coming and pitched and I love what they're doing. I know it's going to make money. You just, you have that gut instinct. But I think I can't work with you every day. And, and for me, it's th th then that's a deal breaker. That's so the person is just as important as the deal to me. I can think of a couple of people. There's one right now, um, guy I met five or six years ago. Uh, I think he's great mm -hmm. and he will build a business one day that'll make him and hopefully me a lot of money, but it's not the one he's running at the moment. So I keep saying no. There was, there was another guy I met seven or eight years ago. He came to me seven times with seven ideas before I found the one that I have now backed. So good for him, good for him for coming. I mean, God knows why he kept coming back because yeah. I kept saying, no, that's not going to work, no, that's not going to work. Sort but he did, so yeah, 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 maybe. And Steve? Yeah, I kind of look at a business and an entrepreneur a bit like a doctor looks at a patient. Um, so nobody is going to be perfect in 100% physical condition or business ready condition. They're always going to have a dodgy foot, a you know, sore hip, whatever it might be. And I think great angel investors actually spot where the weaknesses are, focus on the strengths. Um, and there's an old saying, you know, if you focus on your weaknesses, you just end up with a lot of well-developed weaknesses. You know, it's like asking a fish to climb a tree. So for me, when we look at businesses, it's actually what are the strengths? Some entrepreneurs are amazing at brand and creativity or building a team. Others are quite introverted, but very technical and more engineering type. So it's a building a team around them and them as a leader, having that ability to attract those people, retain them, and lead that team or being given support to lead that team because I think I totally echo what the guys have said um, but also I think the the ability to get the right people around them is fundamental to execution. There's another thing about entrepreneurs which is that the startup entrepreneurs tend mm. to be very good early bulldozers of a business idea they can create the product and get the first customer. Mm. Going from one to ten customers is a very different thing from going ten to a hundred customers you, then you have to build in process and those, those very good early stage uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs may not be good at the scaling part. So very Should often you have to bring in someone who's got the process capability to scale mm. the business and, and persuade the entrepreneur to stand back and let someone else do that part of the equation which they're not good at. Because they will be convinced they are good at it. Yeah. Exactly. And that's it's the baby, challenge. Right? Some of these yeah. entrepreneurs which they create, Completely. They, they won't release. Have you no. got experience of that where you've had an entrepreneur that could be super bright great idea but can't let go can't allow other people to come in with a certain amount of control have you got experience with, with that? 100% I mean so I would say every single business I'm involved with I've had to fire the founder and I'm going to say fire I mean persuade them to move into a different role sure. from from the one they were doing at the beginning bring in a CEO and I've got one today where where we have uh, a co-CEO because this person can't quite cope with the idea of stepping back enough they have stepped back but we've had to bring in someone else as a co-CEO that's the way mm. we've dealt with it I think that can be a double-edged sword as well because I've also seen businesses that have pushed the founder out, brought in the more corporate types who have used to much bigger businesses and don't really get the grittiness of that entrepreneurial startup to scale mm. up phase, and that can be dev that can have a devastating impact as well. Yeah. So I think it's trying to find that right balance. This is interesting. So a follow-on question from that would be: You guys, there's a real value on relationship there and keeping a finger on the pulse. How would you suggest that angel investing is different to? venture capital investor. Yeah, it's just the quantum really in terms of the size the business is at, the scale, mm. the revenue that it's doing. Normally it's got product market fit. It will be doing low millions generally in terms of revenue um, and looking at funding a million, two million, five million at that sort of stage. So as an investor, when you're looking at those things, you expect a, a higher failure rate in the earlier stages, which is why EIS, SEIS, things like that are really, really valuable. Um, but you've just got to be much more convincing as an entrepreneur with the team, the product, the service. You know, we're looking for different things um, at that later stage of investment. I think there's a lesson around communication as well. So, so we're all experienced business people, and I would mm. say 
Uh, I don't mind bad news. I expect lots of bad news in an early startup. What I don't like is surprises. So, so I would say to my entrepreneurs, got a problem, just ring me. Don't let me find out by accident because then I'll be cross. So key there is um, Because the earlier you tell me about it, the earlier I can help you fix it. Uh, yeah. And I said, don't mind bad news, but I do like, I don't like surprises. And dare I say with the experience that uh, you know, you've got from an investment point of view, you actually have the experience to help fix the problem. Mo exactly. Mostly. Exactly. And for me, it's a proximity thing. There will be conversations that founders will have with an angel investor that they wouldn't have with a VC fund. So it is about relationship. Like I'm, I'm the person with some of them that they're on the phone to having a meltdown at Sunday night at 10 o'clock every week. They're not going to do that with a VC. So I'm as much emotional support as I am kind of guidance and you know the financial. It's a very different, much more personal relationship in my doing. experience. That's brilliant. Guys, thank you so much. That's been really interesting. That's the end of the first half. In the second half, we'll take a deeper dive into business growth and investing. Guys, welcome back to the second half of the program. I want to talk about valuation. Valuations of businesses can often be questionable. How do you arrive at a valuation, in your opinion? Well, I've seen people just do yeah. a finger in the air. <laughs> yeah. um, and some angel investors, if it's under five million and they like the person, they like the idea, then they put money in. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got things like sophisticated financial analysis, due diligence, discounted cash flows, getting an accountant or business sale brokers to come in and give an independent valuation. So there's a, a wide swing, really, depending on the stage of the business and the type of the entrepreneur. I personally um, look at the financials, look at the team, do the due diligence, um, and then just take a weighting in terms of the size of the opportunity. Um, so similar to Bob, actually, uh, we look for at least businesses that can be massive, you know, at least achieve unicorn status. Doesn't mean they're going to, um, but they have to have the potential to be able to do that. And if they've got that, then we probably would value them more highly in the early stages. But it's as much an art as it is a science, frankly. Uh, I don't think there is one right way to do it. Um, we've probably all got experiences of doing it well and um, underpaying and doing it badly and overpaying. So, and, and entrepreneurs that have a creative way of putting a valuation in front of you, it's then very different by the time you've picked it apart and done some due diligence. Have you had that experience? Yeah, I think what, what Steve said about the ability of the business to be massive is crucial, right? Because if your business can only ever grow to the value of 50 million pounds, say, then the percentage of it that you have for the amount you put in is really important. If it can be a billion, uh, then you can be a little more lax about how you think about the valuation at the beginning. So I think I that is the most important characteristic in, in any business I look at, is does, does it have the potential to be enormous? Yes. Then you can be a little more relaxed about the valuation at which you invest because you're a very early stage investor. So by definition, you're getting in a, a, a low valuation relative to the potential of business. And also you need to, it's like you said earlier, the founder needs to come with an element of realism, which is often a little lacking. Um, and these things, you know, kind of are at best kind of a projection. So exactly, it's absolutely, as you said, more of an art than science. I think also it's a willing buyer and a willing seller, right? You've got to agree, but that doesn't mean just because other people have invested that that's the right valuation because it might be their best mate from school, it might be friends, it might mm. be family. Other yeah. people might have different reasons for investing which can justify the valuation, so you've just got to be a bit careful of that. That's one of the reasons I'm very careful about putting money at the beginning, where I think I might be used to persuade other people to invest. Exactly. I don't want my name it's to be used. your reputation at risk. I don't yeah. want my, well, I just don't want other people to invest on the back of my, me investing, because no. first of all, I'm not convinced I'm a great investor. Um, but I want them to do their own due diligence, come to their own view, uh, and that's, that's the other reason that I always get some external input, not advice, but so first thing I do when I, when I see an idea that I really like, send it to someone who knows more about that subject than I do, of which there are always lots. Um, usually I know one or two of them, so you know, um, crucial to get the, the, the input from someone who really knows about that, that mm. niche. You, know, you might have a good understanding of general business, but you're not an expert on a particular niche, so go and find the niche yeah. expert and get their input. It's a really good point because you don't want to take kind of accountability, not that there is, but you don't want to take kind of responsibility or accountability for somebody else's decisions. Yeah. And there are plenty of people that will let you or we'll try to make you. Well, and you hear it because they say, oh, you know, X, Y, Z's invested. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a reason yeah. you should invest. Yeah. I mean, what do I know? I know that person built Uber. Yeah. 
So he was either clever or lucky or both, but it doesn't mean he's any good at angel investing. So I'm not going to invest just because I hear X is investing in a business. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to hear my name being used in that way too. No. In a, in a previous conversation we've had, timing has been incredible. How, in your experience, can you almost not predict timing, but be there, right place, right time, and how many sort of experiences on the positive have you had against, dare I say, the negative where, you know, right place, right time, or you would do something right on the cusp of credit crunch or COVID, something out of your control? So one thing I'd say is entrepreneurs tend to be, uh, they come up with an idea for a new product often, sure. and sometimes it's ahead of its time. So it might well be a brilliant idea, but it's going to be another five years before, before the market thinks it's a great idea. Yeah, so you're too early. So I've definitely invested in businesses too early, and it's taken us longer, therefore, to persuade the market that, that the idea is one that's relevant to today. Uh, that, that has happened a lot. So, so when you talk about, I think, timing and luck, in a way, come together um, yeah, quite a lot. That's the perfect marriage. What about you, Steve? I think a practical example of this in recent times would be things like the metaverse versus AI. Okay, so... Mark Zuckerberg has obviously gone very big into the metaverse and um, all these headsets and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and people have been talking about AI for a long time, but it wasn't until the end of November 2022 when ChatGPT came out and it had widespread mass adoption that all of a sudden, you know, I don't know about you guys, but every pitch deck I see now has yeah. got AI on the front cover and most of them have got nothing to do with AI. They're just right. using AI blockchain. in some way. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be blockchain. Now exactly. It's AI, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the metaverse may or may not become a thing, but it's certainly not become as big as I think as Facebook were hoping it would be as early. It might do that, but AI has just exploded. Now, you know, anybody that had an AI business just at the right time when it exploded was quite lucky, frankly. You know, great timing at one level, but actually, um, yeah. So, so I think it's, it's hard, it's really important, but it's very hard to time it perfectly. Oh, absolutely. I think I'm at the other end of the spectrum to Bob and I'm, I tend to get there a little late and wish I'd got, gone in a little bit earlier, but then I'm quite risk averse even with my kind of well, yeah, safer. trading background. But I like to see, for me, it's, it's a case of seeing momentum. Um, before that, kind of can feel like a punt and I like to see that there's, there is momentum building, not only in terms of, it's almost like an energy thing, like you can just feel things are coming together, things are slotting into place, and you're like, oh yeah, well you, can, you can feel mm. like the energy that this thing has got. So I like to see that before I dive in. So I have a weakness in this area, which is I like some of the invest, uh, businesses I invest in give me a window on the future. So I'm in a space tech fund, I'm in a company that takes brands to the metaverse because I wanted to understand the metaverse, right? So it's not just about investing money to make a return. It's actually what you learn from the investment Absolutely. can be useful elsewhere in your business life. Maybe that's a bit of a weakness, but... But, but that's interesting because there's part of you that uh, you ultimately said you don't like to invest in something you know nothing about, but if you're surrounded by people that do, then you, then you ultimately get involved. By default, you're learning, you're becoming a far 100%. wider spread of knowledge and... Makes well, you know, people, people say at the moment, you were, I was picking up on what Steve was saying just now about the metaverse, you know, people say, well, it isn't here yet, it's going to be 10 years. There are 1.4 billion gamers in the world who spend part or all of their day in the metaverse every day, yeah. right That's now. Real. So, so don't let anybody tell you it's not here. It's absolutely here. It may not affect large swathes of the population yet, but it's, but it's coming and it's yeah. big. But it, that also backs up what you said earlier about don't invest because somebody else is investing. You're investing sometimes for other reasons yes. other than that person, that deal, that there's wider kind of implications, considerations. Yes. So. so there's actually almost, there is an emotional element to the three of you investing as angels into something where actually I'd like to know more about that. That's something that means something to me. Whereas dare I say, touching on what we talked about earlier with venture capital, they are looking at it as a blunt investment against return. Would you agree with that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's got, as individual investors or venture funds, have all got their own criteria. Mm. You know, so for, for me, social impact and having a purpose is really, really important. I've got to believe in it's a force for good in the world and that the piece, people behind it are well-meaning and actually I'd prefer to have a business that's mission-driven and then we can work out some of the commercials a little bit later rather than somebody, I just want to make lots of money, lots of money, lots of money, and they're focused on that side of things. So, um, yeah, and then the values there are fit personality-wise between the team. Do you like each other? Do you trust each yeah. other? You're going to be able to get on. It's what I call the ski trip test, right? Would I go on a week skiing holiday with this person? If the answer is yes, great. Then we'll move forward and have a more of a conversation. But if not, you know, sometimes you meet somebody, you feel like a life force is being sucked out of your body. 
uh, they're, they're the ones that I walk away from. And of course that's quite dangerous because I guess we're all at stages of our life where we don't have to hang out with people we don't want to hang out with and we certainly don't have to invest in people we don't want to hang out with, mm -hmm. right? The problem is you can slightly fall in love with the personality and allow that to sway your judgment too much ahead of the idea. What you were saying about it's 50% the person, 50% the idea. You know, you really, really have to be disciplined about yeah. not, not thinking, hmm, I really like this person, I quite like to hang out with them and help them succeed, yeah. but actually their idea isn't a good enough one or they're not capable of delivering the idea. So you have to be really, dis so Steve's much more disciplined than so I You've got to manage the business element with the personal relationship. Because yeah. have you ever had an experience uh, between the three of you of investing in someone and then going through the journey where they've dramatically changed. And that might be because money was being realized and they, they changed or they took their eye off the ball, got complacent, got lazy. You know, have you I've had one that? where I wouldn't say they changed. I just worked out my, my initial assessment was wrong. Interesting. And that wasn't good and I exited. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's examples of myself and I've seen it around me where it's, like, it's, the, it's the fall in love with the person, but also like their potential. And you need to be able to see that they have potential, but you need to have a real kind of belief that they're gonna fulfill it as well. And I've seen kind of people underperform. Sure. Or like you say, get distracted because of the life events or things come in and nobody could have predicted that, but you need to be able to understand if that person has the resilience and the personality or the team around them, as you said, to to be able to handle those things yes. i like to put pe people kind of under stress at the beginning to see how they react because that's only when you see someone's true colors yes. and how are they going to be you know in that those types of scenario going forward so resilience i love, love the way you brought that word in because that's so important yes. you know starting a business is bloody difficult yeah. it's really hard to make yeah. a business successful and not everyone has the grit and determination to keep going so even someone who's at the start is great. You know, it doesn't mean they're going to make it. And that, yeah. that's tough. Um, one of the things I always say to, to my entrepreneurs is uh, they get so subsumed in the business, they immediately give up sport. What if they were a gym goer or a runner or a cyclist? They stop. So for God's sake, don't do that yeah. because that endorphin fix you get once a day from going doing some exercise is what's going to keep your, you know, your brain in the right place. It's not about physical fitness. It's about the endorphin fix for your brain once a day, yeah. keeping you going. That's really that's crucial. That's a great example of mentoring, coaching. You know, it's so easy to get caught up as an entrepreneur. I've, I've been there and I had no one to tell me that actually. And then you're just consumed with emails 100%. and meetings and so on. I do it a slightly different way. I make sure they take holiday because that's something that else that goes. They work every day. There's no days off. There is a limited kind of capacity that people have for that. And I'm like, w you know, when have you got, I mean, a day at least booked off to get some headspace, to get some, yeah, just, yeah headspace and energy back. Yeah, and we're going into the human side of things a lot more here, but then, you know, the amount of entrepreneurs that seem to lose their marriages and just have such a bad balance with the, the family and kids and so on, because they just get consumed by it. You, you're right, you just gotta stay persistent, consistent to be successful, right? And that's something really to think about because that can affect you as an investor. Mm. I've seen things where marriages go wrong and there's divorce, and again, these, aren't, these things aren't necessarily predictable, but they can have an impact. I've seen assets frozen, and that's not somewhere we, you know you want to be as an investor. Yeah. Well, of course, if you look at the stats, I would say divorce is quite predictable. It follows marriage. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, not in my case. I just do have, but <laughs> we talked about it before the break and, and touched on it. Just where, if you've got a, an individual as a founder, as bright as they may, may be, that you've got a single point of failure there. If something happens to them, you know, um, and you've invested in that one person, it might be the brain of this person, just, you know, let alone the um, resilience and so on. Do you ever think about that and very quickly look to try and grow that team quicker because of that? Or do you almost prefer to invest in a team of people that eliminates that, that sort of single point of failure? Yeah, I think it's inevitable in early stage businesses where you do have a single point of failure, but to try and get to a point as quickly as possible where that's not the case. Um, some businesses it takes longer, and it's one of the reasons why I prefer to invest in businesses that may be a little bit later stage, that have a team that's not, yes, there's going to be one or two absolutely key individuals, um, but if you've got a broader team, then it de-risks it. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I do, and I, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the skill set of the founder not being, inevitably won't be the full skill set for the later stage of a business. So the earlier you can build in, uh, build into the team, people who've got the skill sets the founder hasn't got yeah. and complement their... Um, yeah. That, that's what you need to do. Yeah, you can't expect somebody, they shouldn't bring everything to the table, but what they lack, where else can that be plugged in? And, and so team is really key.
That's brilliant. There's so many, so much great information there, whether you're looking at this program from an in investor point of view or from an entrepreneur point of view. So thank you so much, guys. That's all we've got time for. <laughs>